So Claire, what do you hope that your readers take away from the book? What I'm, what I'm hoping for is um, flowers are obviously a lovely, a lovely gift to give and to receive. And um, I think rather than just the random act of giving flowers, um, people will understand that, there's a, that there can be a much greater depth of meaning to even as something um, as simple as a, a bunch of snowdrops. It's not just a bunch of snowdrops, it's, you know, the messages of hope and consolation and the history that they have behind them. If you're thinking of starting a small business, or you're thinking of writing a book, then I'm sure you'll really enjoy my interview this week with Claire Bowen from Honeysuckle and Hilda. Claire is a florist, a teacher, and a writer, but she's also now an author of a beautiful new book, and we'll be talking about it in this week's podcast. A very warm welcome, Claire, to my podcast. Thank you, Rona, for having me. I'm very excited to be on your podcast. I'm so excited. I'm actually very excited just to see you because we haven't seen each other for so long. I think the last time I know. It was at that amazing flower festival, wasn't it? Yes, I think it was. Yes, it's mm. been quite quite a while. Yes. yes. It doesn't it's seem a... that long, but it, it has been a long time. But just <laughs> the days merge into one, I think, at the moment. Absolutely. And but you've been very busy while the days have been merging into one by writing the I book. I have, before we, yes. Before we talk about that, which is so exciting, um, yeah. could you share with the listeners your small business journey, please? Okay, so my small business journey wasn't at all conventional. Um, it's something that I always dreamt of, but I didn't think it would ever happen. And it almost happened by accident. Um, I originally a long time ago, uh, originally I wanted to be a lawyer and I read Greek and Latin and I then decided, no, I wanted to be an art historian and I did a few more degrees and I used to lecture in art history a long time ago. And um, then things changed and I got a sort of more conventional job in marketing, the sort of kind of job that paid the bills and sort of, but for me it wasn't it wasn't the job of my dreams it was it was a means to an end and I absolutely love flowers and I also love writing um and so in my early 30s I left my I left Battersea and I moved to Hackney at a time when not that many people would have thought would have thought to make the move it's it, it's a very different place now but I wanted to be near Columbia Road flower market that was my aim and I used wow. to go to I used to go to flower classes at McQueen's when they were in Victoria Park Village, um, which was a really long time ago. And I did classes at Rebel Rebel had just opened when I moved to Hackney, and I was doing classes there. And I was sort of buying flowers at the weekend, but it was something for me. I I, I couldn't have imagined how I would make that into an occupation. And I also went to the London School of Journalism and did some creative writing classes because I loved writing. But I didn't, I, I didn't think of, I didn't think it would ever happen. I read blogs. I, I think the thing that really swung up for me was Miss Pickering's blog. And um, I, yeah, I just, she really inspired me a lot actually. But again, I, it was only when I had to give up work. Um, I. I don't know how many people know this. It's something I, I talk about because I hope it inspires other people, but I don't want to talk about it so much that people think I feel sorry for myself because I absolutely don't. It's one of those things and it's brought about some really amazing changes in my life, but I was very poorly. And um, when I was waiting for a prognosis, I had to face up to the reality that I hadn't been doing the things I wanted to do and I was quite, I was like, oh, that's really annoying. I could have done all those things and I never did them. And I sort of promised myself if I got better that I would do them. And so I was off, I was off work for a few years. And unsurprisingly, when I went back, they made me redundant because someone else had been doing my job for three and a half years, which wasn't a big surprise. But with the payoff that I got, I used, I invested that in flower class. I thought, right, I'm really going to try and just see if I can do this. 
so it probably <laughs> may have looked strange on Instagram. Suddenly there's person doing, you know, going, oh, I'm going here, I'm going there, and now I'm going to do this. But I was, I was kind of like, I was so alive again and normal conventional me would have put that money in the bank for a rainy day but I didn't do that I just went let's do this and I did some classes I didn't know if it was going to lead anywhere but I in some ways I saw it as part of my recovery I suppose and then people st started writing to me on sorry started writing to me on Instagram and asking me did I do weddings and did I teach? And I was like, don't be silly, why would I do that? And then more people started to write to me and I thought, well, okay. And then my husband said to me, just have a class in the kitchen, see who comes, see if you like it. And so I did that and um, lovely Jen Pinder came along to give me some feedback afterwards and say, yeah, I think you can do it or no, you can't, or these are, you know, so she came up, which was massively helpful. And then I thought, okay, maybe. And then, as you know, I came on your class um, with Fiona to talk about branding and I had no idea what I wanted to do. I did know that I wanted it to be sustainable and environmentally friendly. Um, because of the nature of my illness and the fact that it was put down um, quite specifically to environmental factors and air pollution, um, I had done, which is the reason I left London, and I had done a lot of campaigning against um, pesticides and I was assisting a lady called Catherine Hamlet, who's the fashion designer, and we had been walking our dogs together. I didn't know that she was Catherine Hamlet. And then um, when Hackney Council started using pesticides, um, on the pavement and actually on the parks and dogs started dying because of them so she started a campaign and um, and I ran her 38 degrees campaign for her and we went to government to um, we met with Zach Goldsmith and with Caroline Lucas and the Pesticide Action Network came with us to try and see if we could find a, a way forward and how to stop councils effectively doing this. So I already had that sort of environmental mindset before I started flowers. And so to me at a time when Oasis was um, more widely used and thankfully it is now, to me, I, I was already sort of looking into these things because I'd been told I had to avoid so many chemicals. So it was natural for me if I hadn't been, I probably wouldn't have thought about it at that time, but because those things had happened, I came into it from that angle. Um, so when I came to your class, I knew the thing that I really wanted was to be sustainable and, and, and not much beyond that, I suppose. Um, and so I, I guess after that, I started renting village halls and teaching classes there and lots of lovely people who are now great friends. Now, the, the, sort of the people who come to the first ones, and I'm still in touch with them, and they're all people that you would know on Instagram. Um, and they were sort of lovely and supportive. And then we bought a house. We had been looking for a while because we had to leave London because of the air. And we found one with an outbuilding that was a slightly rundown garage and workshop and a garden. And so we set about turning that into a studio. And at the same time, Dalesford dropped me an email and said, would I like to teach there as a guest florist? And obviously that for me, I love Dalesford, I'm terrible. And um, and for me, that was that was the dream. I was like, oh my goodness, you know, I've been asked to teach at Dalesford. I was very excited about that. And that kind of, and that kind of builds up and then you get customers who come back to you. And so, I think that's, I think that's, I think I, I realized, I did weddings as well, but I think I realized then that my great joy was teaching actually. So I'm sort of at a stage now where, of course the book, and then the book happened. <laughs> and <laughs> I think it's talk about that. And then the book, and then I think a lot of it, so much of it um, is luck because Dalesford happened to find me. I mean, you have to, make your own luck a little bit you have to put yourself out there in the first place but Dalesford getting in touch with me was a great thing and then when I got an email from Penguin Random House sort of out of the blue I suppose it just came in as a, an inquiry on my website saying would you like wow. to write a book so <laughs> as it happens and I looked day, at I'm it sure. yeah <laughs> and I'm looking at it and after all these years of thinking how will I ever write a book 
I got this email saying, would you like to write a book, which is kind of t turning on its head. I had the vision of writing a book and having to go to publishers and, you know, pitching it. And they then came to me with an idea. So, um, so yeah, so that's, that's been an all. So it's all kind of, it's sort of had quite unusual beginnings, but it's starting to fall into place, I suppose. And so I'm hopeful that once the pandemic is over, I will be writing and teaching and at Delsford and at home. And yeah, I've been, so in some ways I've been very lucky. Um, unlucky in other ways, but very lucky in, in some. So I think, I think you've got it's an amazing a, brand though, which is helped by your two beautiful dogs. Um, so uh, your company's Honeysuckle and Hilda, and that's Hilda. your two dogs. Yeah, so Hilda, um, I got as sort of part of when I was poorly, I knew I needed to get up and get out. And so I decided I wanted a puppy and then I got Hilda. And we spent a lot of time out walking and going to Hackney Marshes and looking at nature. And I got involved in, again, some campaigning against development in um, Hackney Marshes that was quite destructive to nature. And it's something that I care about. So again, that was a part of another environmental sort of strand coming through. And um, yes, yeah, so Hilda, we've had, Hilda was sort of with us from the beginning and Honeysuckle was, the name Honeysuckle began with an H and it scanned quite well with Hilda. I thought about Hellebores and Hilda, but I went for Honeysuckle and Hilda. And then when we um, adopted a rescue dog two years ago, um, she had no choice but to be called Honeysuckle. So <laughs> <laughs> it's the only way it was going to work. And it has actually been very photogenic, um, so that's good. So, yes, so they've been a, they're a big part of the team. So, yeah, they're, they're good. It's, I'm, I'm lucky to have them. So the book you've always write sorry you've always wanted to write a book. Yes, yes. I didn't always know what about. Um, I was approached to write a book in my early thirties by a literary agent, but it was an expose of the business I was working in, and I didn't feel comfortable with that so much. But I re I knew I really wanted to write, and and it was always in the back of my mind and friends who used to get perhaps very long emails from me to say, have you ever thought about what you're writing properly? And you I thought maybe they would... Your blog, your blog is maybe so they would... beautifully written. Oh, so thank you. Written. Thank you. I never know when people are thinking she writes too much, maybe just put it in a book <laughs> instead. Or if they would, you know, so so yes, it's all it's been on my mind for a long time. So it's kind of like it's come out of the blue, but it was always also a long held dream. So yeah. So the new Lucky. book, your first book... It's my first book yes the healing power of flowers so can yes. you tell us about what happened after that initial email that you received from penguin so House? after the email i um we had a a chat they had a very specific idea in mind around the language of flowers and i think my instinct was that um the language of flowers has been written about by um, other people before and very well and so I didn't I didn't want to produce something that was just the same sort of exactly the same kind of thing again um, because why because you know why would I and also they wouldn't they wouldn't want that either Penguin Random House wouldn't want that either and so um, I spoke with my editor my editor is so lovely just like oh love her what are they called? and um, the my editor or yeah uh, she's called, called she's called Sam and she um she's specifically Ebri Press um which is really which is a really lovely imprint so I was pretty excited about that and so I said to her that yes I'd, I'd love to work with her um but was there a way in which we could make the book sort of mine I suppose because she had been inspired by my blog she had um, she found me just through one of those, somebody writes top 10 florists, you know, for something. And I was on one of those. And then she looked them up and found my blog. And I had written a blog about uh, not having a big carbon footprint at Christmas and sort of using independence and, and natural gifts and things like that. And she had seen that as a starting point. So I thought, could we put it together? And what we wanted was talking about crafting something out of, flowers that you could give as a low impact gift and at that point the language of flowers comes in because flowers have meaning but um on top of that i wanted to add in other other um factors i suppose so 
I looked a little bit at aromatherapy and homeopathy and sometimes just the energy that something can bring in the garden because a lot of the flowers have quite negative meanings in Victorian times, for instance. So hellebores represent falsehood and foxgloves are associated with lies. But with hellebores, I sort of saw them, they come out in the deep winter and they're really long lasting. And so I sort of translated that into longevity and constancy and applied it to friendships and relationships. And with foxgloves, you know, they're sort of tall and proud and they've got all the bees buzzing around. And so um, I sort of saw them as like a positive energy if someone was going to go and start a new job or, you know. So the, the book is arranged in terms of flowers that you give for a, a specific um, event. I'm just going to look down and tell you what they are. because um, They are joy, calm, love, success, constellation and also celebration. And so um, we would take, books it's it's within those sections I've made sure that all the flowers are arranged seasonally so that people know that when they're available so I talk a little bit why each flower would fit that category um, and sometimes if it crosses two categories I'll mention that as well so it was actually it was actually quite a challenge to be given the topic the headings were given to me and then I had to find flowers to fit them um, but obviously I didn't want to shoehorn anything in. It had to be, I wanted it to be natural. I didn't want to take a flower and go, right, it must go in that category. How can I make it do that? So a lot of the book was thinking about where those things were going. And a lot of the editing process was deciding. And then I'd write it up for one section. And then we'd think, actually, it might be better in that section. And then we'd adjust it slightly, but, 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 but in a sort of natural way so that we weren't forcing anything. But it was a lot of the a lot of the book's process was the thinking about what would go where, and then as we went on, um, I was asked if I could maybe think about bouquets that people could craft quite easily. So it's not sort of something with like fifty five ingredients that you would take down the aisle, you know, that's going to take three hours. It's literally they said to me if somebody had four or five ingredients. Um, you know, and, and so I sort of do a little bit of explanation about um, different types of flowers and how you would put them together. But then I, I've done sort of bouquets for new parents, one for constellation um, and one for everlasting friendship using dried flowers for the winter. And it's sort of so it's almost like sort of flower recipes. And again, um, trying to do it so that the flowers are available at the same time but also a message that was natural. That was another challenge. And of course, all of this during lockdown when um, I had to shield um, because of my lungs. So I wasn't supposed to go out at all. So I was very reliant on uh, local growers. So I'm very close to Green Gorgeous. I'm a mile away and they were immensely, immensely. I mean, what a wonderful place to end up living. And um, so they were, uh, Rachel and Ash were immensely helpful helping with flowers and also the land gardeners um helped me and I went up there and they just made sure that they you know they sort of kept away and I got to you know take my buckets and go and pick there um Esme helped as well so people were um but I I would like to have included more florists um than I than I than I did um but in the lockdown it's a very difficult very very difficult scenario mm. and also because I wanted everything to be seasonal and we were shooting between March and August um wow. some of the flowers had to be dried when that's how we got around it so I think there were 80 flowers there were only like three or four that don't have photographs yeah um and the rest of them are either fresh or dried um to make sure so nothing in the book was imported or bought from um anywhere where I couldn't couldn't trace its provenance because that was sort of the message of the book so I, I wanted to make sure that I practiced what I preached um, now we touched so, on photographs there and yes. Ava Nameth the <gasps> yes. incredible photographer can you tell I me know. how you met Ava and how she came to be involved in the book so I met Ava in um, I don't think my husband will mind me telling the story I'm sure he would um, we, uh, when I, I first moved to um, a village not far from here and Charles would, um, we, we would both go out walking with Hilda, but he would go on quite long walks with her. And I got a, I followed Ava because she had taken some beautiful photographs of Green and Gorgeous. So that's, so I said, we followed each other. And she sent me a note saying, this is going to sound very strange, but I, I 
think I keep seeing your dog. I keep, think I keep seeing Hilda going for a walk near this farm. But she's with, but it's not in London, and and she's with a man. And I wrote back and I said, "Is the man in his mid fifties and quite scruffy?" And she said, "Yes." I said, "Well, that's my husband." And she, and so and she said, oh, "I'd love to, we'd love to meet for a cup of tea." So we met for a cup of tea and we got on really well. She is one of the kindest people you could ever hope to meet. And she was sort of um, quite. She's so busy now. She's like, oh, "Wow." Um, and she was. It was a few years ago. We were both at slightly earlier stages. But um, we became friends. And when I did one of my classes at Village Hall, I invited her to do a photography slot in the afternoon to make it a full day. And um, she took some photos for me. And we just, we live 20 minutes away. So we meet up for tea and tea. And um, she's amazing at baking. She bakes some amazing cakes. And she <laughs> tea and cake and things like that. And then when I got the email from Sam about the book, and it said, um, you need to be comfortable with your own photography or no photographer you would work with. And I, I sort of stipulated straight away, it really needed to be Ava. Um, and her style suits mine really well as well. I think we sort of suit each other in that sense. And so um, they said that that's fine. And I really would like her to be, you know, a big part of a book, not just a photographer in the traditional sense, because we will work together. And um, it was so nice to have somebody to, to work with because there are times during the pandemic when you know things go wrong and there aren't flowers and to, to have someone to do the problem solving with was amazing and I'm so glad um, that she agreed to do it with me because it wouldn't it would not have been the same book without her for it's sure. An, it's amazing beautiful beautiful photographs mm -hmm. that she's taken and um, yeah let's go back to the actual structure of the book so you've got that what made you have healing as the overall arching theme of the messages that the flowers give? Um, it was partly partly driven by the publishers, okay. um, but actually it 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 fitted it fitted quite well in the sense that um, a lot of the, a lot of the flowers have healing properties, not just in the sense of aromatherapy or some of them have a, li a very literal healing one, but some of them have sort of emotional healing powers. So um, a lot of the flowers around constellation like marigolds and snowdrops and things like that were traditionally given when somebody was grieving. So they have a healing property in that sense. So I suppose it was the adjective that sort of pulled together all of the, all of the properties that we were trying to cover so it's 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 not it's not only um physical healing properties um, which i think actually i'm glad you said that because that's that's quite an important point it's 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 about emotionally how they affect people as well absolutely and don't we all need a lot of that at the moment i know say, i know yes so there's all the sections about joy calm um love success consolation and celebration and then you talk about foliage as well and then you go on to your yeah. bouquets to share and then yes. there are three more sections aren't there about pressing drying and sourcing your flowers so why did you add yes. pressing drying and sourcing to the book so um the pressing and drying once once we sort of started going down the road the, the book grew a lot um uh, as it went along i think it, i think it was originally intended to be um a bit shorter than it was <laughs> And I think perhaps, um, unfortunately for the publishers, they set the price before they realised, before they then said, oh, we'd really like to add these things and all the extra pages go in. Because obviously colour books cost a lot of money to produce. And But after we talked about the bouquets, um, I think, I'm not, I'm not sure, uh, the, the request came from them. I know at the time, um, Bex at Botanical Tales, um, he does amazing things and she was, inspiring me a lot and I had been doing some setups in my studio um, trying out some of her drying practice I love drying flowers anyway and um, it's literally just it's not it's it's nothing like you know the um, depth that she goes into but it was just again it's a way of gifting it, it's something creative to do it's the way of gifting that's low impact it's a way of giving flowers out of season as well so that you know, a, a bit like um, Valentine's Day is in February, so 
what kind of seasonal flowers can you find then or you know if you want to give someone a present in January what do you do so the flowers that have been dried over the summer are perfect um, for using in the winter so the pressed flowers and the dried flowers sort of fitted in with the gifting aspect of the book um, the sourcing uh, was my request I was very keen to talk about um, where to where to source one's flowers um, I think I, I, I think um, having arranged the book seasonally it, it, it meant and, and telling people that they should that ideally this is what they should be aiming to do it made sense to give them some pointers about about how to, how to go about it and also where to source those things so um, I've talked a little bit about you know florists and markets and the right questions to ask and also you can buy flowers in supermarkets they're not always wrapped in plastic from abroad more and more like Sainsbury's have committed to only wrapping flowers in paper now which is amazing and um, a lot of them are seasonal if you if you sort of look look for the right things so I didn't want to say don't don't do this and don't do that I wanted to encourage to sort of go go to the right places and also um, I would love to have listed all my favorite flower farms but we couldn't we couldn't decide how to fit everybody in so in the end we listed the, the stockists that I'd used for supplying flowers and ceramics and um, a few of the props and things like that but then we sort of used the umbrella terms of flowers from the farm and the British Flower Collective and also because the book will be in the US in a few months time, the publisher out there has um, bulk bought the rights to, I think the first 5,000 yeah. over there with the possibility of more, hopefully if it sells well. And so we've included like um, directories for the US and Canada and globally we've also, and obviously we mentioned people like Florette, just so that people who perhaps aren't in our Instagram sphere, I think, I think the point of the book is not just to appeal to florists but to appeal to people from a broader base as well um so i hope it will still be i, I hope it will still be useful to florists particularly if you want to know the meaning of you know property of a flower we are stuck for something to say on instagram you know it's all there but um what i was really hoping with the book because of the way it's being marketed and sold and so so many places places i would never have thought of or had access to i'm hoping it's going to go to a broader base and be part of a bigger movement of explaining to people about flowers so the same way people other say chefs are uh, explaining to people about seasonal produce and farming and sustainability I would hope that it's going to go out to a, a wider audience as well and so it seemed right to point them in the right direction and to explain the best ways that they could go about doing this I'm hoping it's not too bossy I don't think it's too bossy no, but it it's, it's something it's before. something I'm very passionate about um, so I'm, I'm hoping it's just sort of setting people on that path. Have you got a copy in front of you? I have, yes. Can you just show it to people? Because I haven't got one. I've only got the PDF right. Oh, no, you haven't got the... It no. should be with you very soon. So this yeah, is this is so the copy. beautiful cover, very distinct and green. Yes, uh, we were quite surprised to be asked about the green, but once we, once it arrived, we loved it. But yeah. it was, it was, it was like bright green, are you sure? <laughs> So I won't mind me saying that. Bit. Yes. <laughs> let's talk a little bit about how you researched the book and what kind mm -hmm. of writing software you use and your process, because you say yes. you love writing. So how yeah. did you, did you have a spot that you um, used to always go and sit in to write or, or what, tell us about your actual writing process for people my who actual, think about writing a book? My writing process, I, I did a lot of it. I had uh, coronavirus early on in sort of around about February and it hit, it, we both did and it hit us very hard. So I was quite tired and I did, I mean, really, I did quite a lot of the writing in bed. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, no, but it's true. Go ahead. Um, and, <laughs> computer, and also, uh, oh yes, on a laptop, absolutely. Okay. And um, I had um, probably about 20 or 30 books as reference points. And I did a lot of research on the internet it was frustrating that I couldn't go to libraries mm. and find older books so sort of when I was doing my degree I was so used to sitting in the library in a corner 
and and I loved that process. But this this time around was unusual. They were very unusual circumstances. I couldn't go out and do that. I do also have. Um, I nearly today uh, had my pink flower, flowery wallpaper behind me, and I thought that you might not be ready. <laughs> the world might not be ready for my pink flowery wallpaper for a podcast. But I have a I have a little spot with an old uh, an old wrought iron table and sort of table and chair. Um, and I sort of I, I sort of hole up there and I have another you know, in my bookshelves there. So I did quite a lot there as I got better. Um, I did it very traditionally. I didn't use a software package because I, I had lovely editors and copy editors and typesetters. The, um, the big advantage of working with somebody like Ebri is that they had so many people to help with so many things. So I literally did it in, in Word. Okay. And I would research um, 10 flowers at a time, send them across. They would have a look, decide whether they like the, the tone of the writing and, you know, any pointers. And then I'd do another 10. And then they were like, and then with a bit of backwards and forwards, they're like, well, you know what we're looking for now. And then I sort of went away and I would did the other 60 on my own. Um, and then the editor, Sam, went through it and then came back to me. And then, because I thought in my deadline was July and I thought, middle of July I submitted it the day before my birthday I thought hooray it's done and of course <laughs> it's nothing like done and so you know then Sam came back to me so then I wrote things and then it went to the copy editor and the copy editor was someone who'd edited other books in the subject and they fact check they fact check it and they ask lots of questions and if there are things that they think aren't clear to readers and they will say you need to explain this or this doesn't join with that. And so then I would put those things in and then it would go back to the editor and she might not agree with everything that, that I or the copy editor thought. So then we'd have another discussion, but eventually, um, eventually we pull it together. So there's so, there are so many processes. It's been really interesting um, way to learn about publishing and, and to know for future, if I did write another book, um, all the processes that are involved. Um, but I was lucky and everybody I worked with has been absolutely charming. And they um, gave, they, apart from telling us about the colour schemes for the, the colour palette for the book. So my studio, for better or worse, is quite pink. And um, they, so we used some of it was pink. And then some of Ava has some backgrounds of sort of grey and cream. And then they introduced this bright green that they really liked, which... I can see it does work really well, and um, they and 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 so so Ava had had sort of within you know they were like we would like flat lays or um, uprights, but they 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 sort of gave us some parameters, but also a Ava had you know um, some leeway as well, and they were very receptive to suggestions as well. Um, so Ava's obviously very create, creative and very, and she absolutely has an amazing eye for something. And she was like, well, I think it should be this way. Um, so yeah, there were so many processes that go into the, um, into a book. I had no idea. They've been amazing. It's been a great way to spend a year. Um, but yes. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. So it's okay. Just knock my microphone there. Um, huh? So it took you from you started it last March, is that right? Yeah, the discussions. Till July. It took till July for the original. There were a couple of months of discussion about what it should be about. So okay. when I started in March, we'd spent two months talking about the language of flowers, you know, versus sustainability, and how it, how it would have to be to work for both of us. So we agreed all that before I signed a contract. Um, so it was a few months of work pre-contract, and then started in March and yeah finished the copy in July and photography towards the end of August okay. um, to give us some more time to shoot flowers that were coming in so for instance we wanted dahlias so we were desperately hoping that dahlias would come out because uh, the printing because because the book is printed sustainability sustainably and then it's not flown back it's shipped back and that takes a long time and so that you have to allow extra time for all of these things. It takes longer to, to produce a book in a more sustainable way. So that, that's why the deadline was quicker because they wanted this book to come out in advance of Mother's Day. That was how 
that was to make it commercial for them and how were they going to sell the book so they saw it as something that would be a lovely mother's day present so they had so in march last year i i knew that they wanted fourth of march as publication date that was always there and then you sort of set deadlines working backwards from that for everything right so this podcast is going to go live the day before um mother's day it's going to go live on march the 13th so people will be able oh, to wonderful. rush out to the store oh, great or even order online with a reputable online company <laughs> yes get it delivered the next day so oh, how wonderful, oh what wonderful timing yeah. well happy mother's day to everybody who's watching this <laughs> <Do that. laughs> or listening <laughs> so claire what do you hope that your readers take away from the book what I'm, what I'm hoping for is um, flowers are obviously a lovely, a lovely gift to give and to receive. And um, I think rather than just the random act of giving flowers, um, people will understand that, there's a, that there can be a much greater depth of meaning to even as something um, as simple as a bunch of snowdrops. It's not just a bunch of snowdrops. It's, you know, the messages of hope and consolation and the history that they have behind them. And so, or bringing together lots of different flowers, lots of different layers of meaning and the thoughtfulness that can go into that rather than just quickly grabbing something off a stall and going, here's some flowers for mum. They can really sort of look at it and think about the message that they want to put across and um, then see the flowers that are available to them and sort of choose accordingly to sort of, and then it's a, you know, it's sort of the difference between maybe um, preparing a meal for somebody from scratch because you thought really hard about the ingredients and the ingredients that they like. Uh, again, it's it, it's that it's that kind of thing. It's it's not just quickly grabbing something off the shelf. It's buying all the ingredients and putting it together yourself. I suppose to be an an analogy that might work. It's an amazing analogy. Amazing. I think you should make that an Instagram post. <laughs> Excellent. I shall. I thank you. Thank you. Because I've got I've got 10 days to go and I'm running out of things to, well, to say every morning. So I shall use that. Thank you, Rena. I shall use You're that. You're welcome. And please, on one of your Instagram posts, can you put the description that you use for ranunculus? Because it's so beautifully written, the way you describe oh. it. So I really, I've just gone all tingly just saying it when I read it at the weekend. I was like, oh, that's so lovely. So please make that an Instagram okay. An example okay. of one of my descriptions that I use in the book. Okay, I shall I shall do that. Excellent. <laughs> so Thank what you. did you love most? You're welcome. What did you love most about writing the book, Claire? What did I love most about it? Um, I think the excitement of fulfilling something I'd always wanted to do. I, thought, I am writing a book. And... Um, yeah, the fact that somebody had the, the confidence. I don't have a huge amount of confidence. I'm not um, in myself. So for somebody to come along and say, we trust you to do this. And then the, the book becoming a, a reality. I think this morning was one of the mornings when I put a post on Instagram and it said, you know, 10 sleeps to go. And I thought, now I'm talking to Rona. Oh my goodness. Um, it's actually happened. And it, it's one of those things... Um, Certainly 10 years ago when I was doing something that I wasn't, you know, you know it wasn't fulfilling for me. Um, the, the, the sort of, I suppose, the, the long, the, the amount of time I spent wishing I could write a book, not necessarily about flowers, but just generally, and then the flowers coming into it. And just to sort of... Um, yeah, the, 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 fact, the, fact that I'm, the fact that I'm doing it and it's going to be out there and yeah I love I, I I enjoy writing and I I quite I quite enjoyed people coming back to me with constructive criticism um, not everybody loves it but I'm always quite interested to see what people have to say about my writing and I said at the beginning to my editor it's probably going to be quite wordy she said it's easier for me to cut things out than it is for me to say where is it so we'll be fine <laughs> and um, and so the same way I'm quite chatty, I'm, I'm quite I'm quite wordy as well. And she was right, she did. There was quite a lot of editing. And a couple of times I had to say, actually, no, that is important to me. And this is why it's important. And um, Sam was great at going, OK, if you, you know, but equally I was good if she said, I don't think we need that. If I didn't feel strongly about it, I'd go, that's fine. 
if you think we don't need it, then we don't need it. Um, so I found I found the process of it, the editing and the feedback really useful because hopefully when I start writing something else, I have that experience behind me as well. So it's sort of a little bit like being paid to learn. Which is wonderful. <laughs> Which is wonderful, yes. Yeah. So Why would you say good. no to constructive feedback from such a well-known publisher as well? I know, I know. It's It's been, I think, the whole way through the process, I've, been, I've never thought, you know, I, I've never been, that's a double negative, I was going to say, I've never not been aware. I've always been aware of how lucky I am mm. to be doing it. Absolutely. Yeah. So what advice would you give to someone who is considering writing a book, Claire? Writing a book? What advice would you give them? What advice would I give them? I think in my case, it was different because I was approached to write it, which was a bolt from the blue and extremely lucky. Um, but you, you make your own luck, Claire. You, you were the person writing those blog posts. I think I think that's good I think that's a good advice is it would be to I yeah, as you say I wrote a blog and I haven't written on it um for gosh almost 11 months because I've been writing the book I've been writing something else but before that I did try and put examples of writing out there and a lot of the time I was doing it because I enjoyed it but of course there's always the hope if if publishers are looking for somebody or if you're approaching publishers it's always good for them to have a point of reference where they can see stuff that you've done before. Um, so I, I think, yeah, I think regular posting, which I haven't been brilliant at in the last few months because it's been wet and cold and pandemic-like. Um, but I think in, in normal times, um, sort of putting, putting yourself out there and also having a, a clear idea of what it is you want to do and what you can bring to the book. Because um, that was something when we, when we, when ha although um, Sam approached me to write the book, we then had to put something together for her to pitch to her team to get it approved. So it wasn't pre-approved by Ebury Press. It was an editor, Ebury, saying, "I've had an idea. I think you'd be great to write it. Can we do the proposal together to pitch you to do it and see if we can get it through?" So it wasn't a done deal when she approached me. We had those few months of you know, formulating the book and, you know, and they wanted to know why I would be the right person. So you have to have an idea of why you, sh why you should be the person to do it, even so if it's terrifying. A point, don't you? Yeah. Um, because if I hadn't already been writing about sustainability and if I hadn't been working with, for instance, Dalesford, it would have been harder for me to say I am the person who should be writing a book on sustainable gifts. So, so, even though it's terrifying to put yourself forward, I know how scary I find it. <laughs> <laughs> and really, I want to go, what, me, really? Are you sure? You know, you have to be able to go and say, I need to, you should choose me to write this because, um, which is, for, yeah, you're yeah, known I'm known for your environmental mm -hmm. um, conversations that you have and how strongly you feel about them. Yes. Um, yeah. So 2021, hopefully, yes. we'll be coming out of this lovely pandemic. Oh, fingers what crossed. Does, <laughs> what does 2021 have in store for Claire? For Claire? Well, um, I'm hoping uh, more teaching. The hope is if the, um, depending on when lockdown lifts, um, I think I'm allowed to say this, Delsford are creating a lovely garden room at the moment. Wow. And they've asked me, if I will go and do a book signing there, um, which would be wonderful, or an event, which would be a great way to in person kickstart it, because obviously at the moment there's nothing happening online. And so um, some, more, some more teaching there, I would think. Um, but largely uh, my studio in 2019, we had the whole process of building the studio. And then of course, the first thing that happened was a pandemic. So. Mm. Uh, not not very much has happened in there so I so I think my my aim is to do more writing um, I do have another book in mind wow. so I'm hoping which I'm hoping somebody will look sympathetically on um, but that's another discussion to be had and so more writing and more teaching and also we have taken on a garden now which 
having lived in London for so long, it's about a third of an acre, but to me, it's, you know, it looks like a vast forest. <laughs> so I'm, <laughs> and it has its own little cutting garden. So I've, I've got to get, wow. I did a, I did a garden design class with the land gardeners last year, just before lockdown. And then we didn't really, we, we sort of started replacing hedging and planting roses, but we didn't get to fulfill all the things we wanted to do. So I'm hoping a lot of gardening as well. So what I'd like to do, although I'm so blessed with green and gorgeous, um, I'd also like to be growing a lot of a lot of the sort of the twiddly bits that are hard to come by. So I'm hoping to do some more growing, but I'm I'm very much not yet a grower. I see people on Instagram and think, wow, how did you do that? So I need to I need to pull my socks up and get out there. I got lots of gardening tools for Christmas. I think it was a hint from my husband. <laughs> so, so I'm going to be out use. there. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I no, I, 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 don't think it came with an offer of help. I think it came, but I'm sure he will. I'm sure he will. He's a very kind man. But he was like, here, here's everything you asked for in your Nawaki wish list. Um, go forth and go, go forth and garden. So, oh, wow. and the dogs will love that. So, yeah. So you mentioned teaching. What kind of courses or workshops do you think you'll be? running what can people what learn of, from you what can people learn from me um traditionally the three the three that i've done are sort of bouquets and arrangements and wreath workshops i think i particularly enjoy the arrangements i think they're my favorites why is that um do i don't i don't know i think with bouquets when i i found when you teach bouquets it takes me quite a long time to make one but sometimes people um can make them quite quickly and there's it's not quite the same process i'm trying to think of a way to describe it it's an amazing it's an amazing thing to do and i love teaching it but i i think the arrange the arrangement thing i think maybe i love arrangements the most i'm going to put that the out there and say well, that don't you? yeah i have a quite <laughs> you're a bit of a containerholic <laughs> uh yes it has this has been pointed out to me the studio <laughs> is full of containers and I'm always thinking about what what the next bar is going to be um and I love I do I do I do absolutely love bouquets as well and um wreaths I, I love I love teaching autumn wreaths and Christmas wreaths and I do quite a lot of one-to-one seem to be the things that I have the most of um which I really enjoy because it gives you the day to get to know somebody and you can tailor it around the things that they're hoping to hoping to learn um and if somebody think hasn't what, seen your work before Claire how would you describe your floristry style the floristry style it's quite wild quite loose I wouldn't it's not if you want to learn to make a very neat and contained okay or arrangement I'm probably not the right person for you because I'm it's um uh it's quite asymmetrical it's very naturalistic. I sort of like to be inspired by the garden and um, the shapes that come out of a garden and sort of translating that into a bouquet or an arrangement. Um, and obviously lots of people have lots of questions about sustainability or about Instagram. I get asked lots of questions about Instagram, um, which are actually not as easy to answer as they used to be because Instagram's changed quite a lot. Um, so sort of the, the general chat, people um, come with all, all sorts of questions, um, which I really love and I love talking, luckily. So it's, it's, um, it's something I really, really enjoy doing. So I hope I get to do more of, more of both. I don't do big classes anyway, because I like to make sure everyone has enough attention. So I wouldn't really take on more than four or five in the studio, maybe six at Dalesford because they've got more space. But I don't, I don't do big classes. In that sense won't it be so lovely to have social interaction in person <laughs> i know it'll be so nice i did teach a class one class during when lockdown was lifted mm. and i had about a month where i wasn't supposed to be shielding the thing that was difficult apart from the fact it was pouring with rain that day the thing that was difficult was that i couldn't go over and people were doing bouquets and i wanted to sort of go and point to things or take flowers over or just tweak things a little bit that would make such a difference and so then you're trying to explain to people from two or three meters away no not that bit that bit and it was it it wasn't the same experience actually 
but so when lockdown is over yes then and you can just go up to people immunized. yeah i know yeah. it will hopefully. be hopefully <laughs> yeah well they seem to be getting through it the immunizations pretty quickly so, so fingers I think crossed we'll this summer everything so much more won't we once yeah we're i think a different kind of normal but an, yeah a, a new normal <laughs> yeah a new normal but i think i think one will be incredibly grateful for so where can people buy your book Claire, in the uk well um i think in in sort of lots of sort of conventional places it's on lots of online bookstores i know it's on waterstones and blackwells and my favorite at the moment is bookshop.org because they support independent bookstores while they're closed which is uh wonderful and um I know there were there were talks about big. I'm not absolutely sure on all of them, but there were some sort of bigger stores outside of bookshops that were being approached. Um, certainly, it's obviously going to be at Dalesford. Um, I think I, I think sort of the, the, hopefully the, the normal places where you would go to buy go to buy a book because it's Hebrew Press, and I think I think they have quite a far reach. So um, online, certainly, it should be very easy to get hold of. Brilliant. And, you and in bookshops, if... Go on. And in bookshops when they're open. Yes. <laughs> soon, <laughs> hopefully. Soon, yes, yeah, soon. You mentioned the US as well. When do you think the book's going to be available in the US? I think that's a few months away. Um, I, I heard about that before Christmas. Um, and they said it was, I think, maybe three months. I would, I would need to check with the publisher, but certainly... In the summer, I think they really? said late, later in the summer, which was, you know, as, as specific as they could be at the time. But certainly, a publisher's taken on uh, the rights to do that over there, which is really exciting. So, so, so exciting. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Maybe we'll have to do a book tour. I'm joking. I'm joking, but <laughs> <laughs> that would be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah, oh, I imagine just need to that. Go to the states. <laughs> yeah. Well, to be honest, if I escape the village, it would be. <laughs> I love my village, but I've seen a lot of it recently. <laughs> and they of me they of me yeah so where can people find out more about you and your business claire i think on my on my you see every time you ask me a question i think oh that's something else i should do i would say on my on my website um which is honeysuckleandhilda.com mm -hmm. i'm going to spend a few days i think between now and publication um adding some new photographs because everything we photographed last year was for the book um i haven't been allowed to share all of that so cool. because obviously it's specific to the book so um but yes doing and doing some right i've got i've got some writing in mind for that um but every, everything is on there and i've got some lovely photos of the studio that should really be be going up there as well um so yes that's 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 the best place to look i think at the moment and instagram and Instagram, yes, thank you, Rona. Instagram, I'm at Honeysuckle and Hilda on Instagram. And I'll be doing, now that now that I've sort of got this project done and it's time for some flowers and I've got all the tulips growing in my garden, hooray. I planted them optimistically thinking I would be teaching in sort of March, April. And um, last year I did the same thing, but it didn't matter because we had the book. So there's one picture in the book which has about two or three hundred tulips in it because we didn't have it. Oh, on your table. Have, on the table yeah. because yeah. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't even because I had coronavirus, I couldn't even give them to people in the village oh. um, because you know, and we were the first people to get it. So we were like, everybody was incredibly kind with you know shopping and prescriptions and all of those things but you know we sort of had an you know a cross on our door so I couldn't say to, couldn't say to people um you know do you come and take some tulips and say thank you I couldn't I just couldn't do that because in case they were we didn't know at that stage mm. exactly how the virus was passed mm. on so, so yes I'm going to have you know another five or six hundred in the garden, well, in the garden. For Instagram, yes <laughs> so so much so much content hopefully coming this way um, so that's going to be, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting back into the swing of that um, a lot more than I have been. So I've got sort of 10 days of chatting about the book before publication and then getting back into the, oh, look, the flowers are here and, and um, yeah, and lots of lovely arrangements and bouquets and, you know, all of those things. It's, it's, Brilliant. it's good. It's been a long winter, so I'm really looking forward to that. Thank you. Longest winter.
Thank you so much, Claire. It's been so, so lovely catching up with you. And I found out things about you that I never knew. And um, okay. yeah, I'm just so pleased for you that you had this dream mm -hmm. of writing a book and it's actually happened. Mm -hmm. And um, just putting yourself out there on your blog and Instagram obviously has reaped lots of benefits, hasn't it? Well, thank you so much for having me. And yes, you're right. It's one of those things where if you sort of put yourself out there, maybe maybe you'll get lucky I got lucky I have to be honest but if I hadn't put myself out there I wouldn't have done so it's 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 a combination thank you so but thank you Rona so much for having me I really enjoyed talking to you yeah you're welcome you're welcome and thank good you. luck with the book launch um, here oh, at the States. thank you thank you so much so I hope you enjoyed my interview with Claire. It was so lovely to see her again after so long and share her exciting news about her new book. Claire touched on some key points in the interview and she has kindly written them down for me and I'll be including them. There are three practical tips that she'd like to share. So I'll be including them together with Ava, her photographer's photography tips, three of those in a special download to accompany this week's episode. So I'll put a link so that you can download that below. So if you're looking for a beautiful book to buy someone who you know loves flowers and would like to know more about the meaning of flowers, I highly recommend getting a copy.